Well, it's a, a great pleasure and privilege to have a chance to talk to Richard Sennett, whose work I've long admired. Richard, when and where were you born? I was born in uh, the first day of 1943 uh, in Chicago. And um, tell me about your ancestry as far back as you'd like to go. Well, let's see. My grandparents were all Russian. And I suppose the only thing that was noteworthy about them was on both sides, both my maternal and paternal side, uh, they were a mixed marriage of Russian Orthodox and Russian Jewish. Quite unusual, unusual at the time in, in Russia. speak as loudly as is really comfortable because uh, this this mic will want to pick up. Oh, all right. Um, my grand that was my great grandparents yeah. and my grandparents uh, fled Russia. Which uh, part of Russia was uh, Saint Petersburg. Yeah. Uh, after the revolution, yeah. and uh, my uh, paternal grandparents like many Russians, stayed in Canada for a while, and my maternal grandparents went to Chicago. And so, so uh, a, a little less familiar route for Northern Russians, for white Russians uh, in uh, Chicago. And um, what were their occupations? My, uh, I don't know what my paternal grandfather did, but my maternal grandfather was an amazing man. He was uh, in, in the States uh, and then became an inventor. He had been a mathematician, he had trained as a mathematician in, uh, in St. Petersburg. And because he came out of this religiously mixed background, uh, his chances of having a university career as a professor were somewhat dim. Russians are terribly anti-Semitic people. You know. And I think somebody from mixed marriage probably even more. Um, the mixed marriage, the, the, the parentage is important. Was it his mother who was Jewish or his father? His father. So he wasn't actually technically well, Jewish. Well, yes, <laughs> that's that's a distinction you'd make. Uh, I don't think other people would would know that. Uh, and then there was scandals in which married Jew in the nineteenth century. Anyhow, um, he uh, he had this uh, terrific uh, mathematical training, and when he came uh, to the states. He put it to use as an inventor. He worked for the General Electric Corporation uh, as a kind of in-house inventor, which is, a, in capitalist terms, a very sad thing because uh, he worked on the mechanism for the answering phone. And if he patented it himself, you know, our life would have been a very <laughs> richer, <laughs> different thing. The General Electric Company. And my parents, uh, who came from this very similar uh, cultural background, uh, were both uh, in revolt against it, probably why they married. They were both Communist Party members. Just about the most edibly challenging thing you could do to a, a Russian immigrant family is join the Communist Party. And, um, Uh, my parents uh, separated when I was about seven months old, so I was brought up by my mother. Uh, I, uh, I only got to know about my father's family much later in life, but I was brought up by her. And uh, we lived in a housing estate called Cabrini Green, which I've written about in uh, the book of mine on uh, 
respect. It's mm-hmm. kind of the, the, the uh, And my mother was a social worker there. She was also working undercover for the Communist Party. Because after the Second World War, the Party of the United States um, felt that its its last best hope for a kind of revolutionary uh, uh, base were blacks who had moved up, African Americans had moved up from the South uh, into the northern cities to work in the war industries. And the party with its typical blinders. Imagine that these people would see themselves as a ground-down industrial proletariat. Of course, for them, they were upwardly mobile. (laughs) (laughs) Um, uh, They had paychecks for the first, you know, regular paychecks. They had government support. They had legal impediments, which in the American South, they were sharecroppers. They were like serfs. So this was, I'm sorry to say, a project of my mother's, which (laughs) failed. And she also left the she was half in and half out. She left the party. I think she was half in and half out. She, you know, the 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 effect of the Hitler-Stalin pact in 1939 was uh, very uh, shaky to to communists in the United States, who were not sh- shaken by the Shotras, who disbelieved in them. There's a big difference between. The far left in the U.S. and the far left in in uh, in Britain, for mm-hmm. example, for whom the show trials were a kind of moment of disillusion. Um, but what happened to a lot of people is in the U.S. is that the Hitler-Stalin pact meant that they looked for some alternative uh, version of communism rather than leave it as a movement. They wanted to get out of the clutch of the American Communist Party. And I think that's where my, what happened to my mother. It's very, uh, by the time I could talk to her about all of this, and she'd had a lot of distance from it, she was blind and fortunately very fuzzy, so it's very hard to get facts about but anyhow, that's that's so. This this is the mil- milieu I grew up in. Was she poor or rich or? We were um, reasonably off. No, we fluctuated wildly. My grandfather was my maternal grandfather was quite well off, mm. uh, but you know my mother had become a pariah mm. to him, uh, and. Uh, so when I was very young, we were very poor. And then gradually as he got to be an old man, he softened a bit more. Uh, my mother had also refused to take money from him. You know, you can imagine this classic, classic scene. Uh, so we gradually became, I would say, lower middle class by the time I... This is in southern Chicago, is that all? Yeah, it's uh, near west of Chicago. Mm-hmm. The only British analog to Cabrini Green would be the estate that was built by, I uh, blocked out his last name, Ralph Summoner or other, a famous estate that degraded within about five years. It was a kind of modernist uh, uh, showpiece which in five years had collapsed. And that's what Cabrini Green is like, built by uh, followers in East Fonderola, very clean, very spare. And uh, so that that was my what was your was my background. What was your mother's character like, and how did it affect you? Do you think? I mean, she was oh, she an intellectual or very? Oh no, she was very close. Uh, well, she was very rigid ideologue. Mm-hmm. She had a very sweet uh, uh, sort of motherly surface, mm-hmm. but about politics, she was an absolute uh, iron. Uh, 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 Iron Will. So I have a story about her. My wife, Saskia Sassen, when we uh, 
were visiting, I know what to call I know what to say to her. You know, her mind was wandering. This was in the, I guess, the late 80s, late 80s, 1980s. And she remarked to her, isn't, isn't this wonderful about Gorbachev? performance of Gorbachev. And she said, your mother suddenly shed about 40 years and she looked at me and she said, what's wonderful about a loss of discipline? <laughs> <laughs> and then reverted to this rather daughter, uh, which is quite ferocious. Hmm. The world I grew up in is, I think for British people, would be familiar in a way from the last half of Ralph Ellison's amazing novel, The Invisible Man. The first half is what everybody reads, you know, this black hmm. young man coming to uh, up north. But the last half of it is really about Blacks and kind of uh, white intelligentsia, radical intelligentsia, if you like. And uh, it's, um, he's got it just, just right. It's a world of people who are attacked from without by McCarthy. They're attacking each other because of the collapse of the party. The blacks are looked at as the savior of the left. So it's a it's a it's a very peculiar uh, and very unrepresentative slice of American life. It's something um, very hard to account. The left never had a kind of presence in the, in the states that it had in Britain, as you know. Mm. Did did she did the Jewish heritage pass on to her at all? Did you have brothers and sisters? I have uh, a couple of uh, half-brothers and sisters whom I have met only glancingly because they're from a prior illicit liaison of my father's. And mm -hmm. uh, um, they seemed quite nice, but I, I never grew up with them. Mm -hmm. uh, and I myself left home when I was 15. Mm -hmm. So my family life was not so, uh, it, it was in one way quite wonderful because, uh, you know, it was this, uh, it was a very mouvement day. Mm. Uh, and I, uh, as I think I told you, I was studying music. Mm. Uh, but I was also glad to get out of this world. And when I was able to support myself as a, as a musician, uh, I left. <laughs> to, uh, to leave the parental home, but I was making enough money to, to mm. support myself. So. Well, that's, um, I mean, that's me. Yeah, well, <laughs> so now you know my inner life. <laughs> well, part of it. There's more to come, I hope. Um, going back to the first sort of five years, do you remember anything else about your, before going to school, any incidents that shaped you? Well, I'm sure everything did. Mm -hmm. But you can't remember uh, that in but, uh, No, I mean, my childhood was really marked for me by the... the I mean, it was tough, this Cabrini Green. It was, mm -hmm. you know, it was a housing estate. But my childhood was really marked for me by, by playing music. Mm -hmm. and when did you start? What I started you? when I was five. Mm -hmm. And I started with the piano, and then... Um, I started playing the cello mm. uh, by accident, as these things usually kind of was a little quarter size. Actually, it must have been an eight size cello in the school. I was at. And, um, and I really took to it, and, um, and I had a gift for it. So, you know, it was. Um, um, it, it, it was it sort of filled my childhood. Quite, quite rapidly in it. So uh, I was spending a lot of time, you know, practicing with great pleasure. Uh, um, and uh, I was the only musical person in my family, 
which was also a gift, a blessing. <laughs> so, uh, Let, well, let's, let's continue the theme of music through a bit yeah. of your life, because how was it that playing a cello gave you enough money to leave home, I think? Well, I was playing in something called the Bach Cantata Group, which was, it was an, uh, a group of, as we thought, period instrument players, mm -hmm. they were hardly period instruments. But we had a, a grant from, um, I think it was the, the National, the Presbyterian Church, to drive around parts of the Midwest, outside of cities, and play on Sunday mornings Bach cantatas. And uh, we had a Volkswagen. What Volkswagen. cantatas? Bach. 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 Cantatas. We yeah. played uh, singers, and mm -hmm. uh, we had a 42 little portative organ we could mm -hmm. take. We went to all sorts of places. I, 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 I mean, something that is engraved in my mind is when we made a swing through the mining district in Minnesota, uh, what's called the Upper Midwest, which is, uh, their color is just a, a roughness of what you see in Wales. And Exhausted miners, you know, it's iron mining rather than coal mining, but it's the same kind of rough underground. Work. What's engraved in my mind is playing in these little churches where these guys, had, uh, women had never heard live classical music. And these exhausted miners sleeping while we were playing. And um, it was wonderful. Playing to them as they slept. Out of this exhaustion. Do you understand what I mean? There's a mm. kind of. Um, and of course, they'd heard something, but I mean, it was, we had lots of occasions like that where uh, we were the first classical musicians people had, had ever seen, had ever heard. Mm. Um, sense of, 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 you know, that music, we think of the Bach cantatas as being very recherche, mm -hmm. but there is something very, uh, we always use the English translation, always, something very direct about them, even, uh, even the big dramatic Something that just speaks very simply to, very directly to people. So it was a fantastic experience for me. And I was, well, I was playing a little in Chicago and in, uh, in New York. And um, then uh, I, I went to the University of Chicago, I enrolled in it in order to study with a wonderful cellist named Frank Miller, who had been Casal's uh, principal cellist in Casal's orchestra in, uh, in uh, Pau. And, um, and I worked with him for a couple of years in Chicago. Uh, and then I went to New York. And I prepared to study uh, uh, at Juilliard for a, a workshop with Pierre Monteux, the conductor. And I know this, this is a career line for musicians, uh, for cellists. I don't know why. Maybe it's <laughs> because we're the most important, you know, <laughs> harmonic voice in the orchestra <laughs> that uh, many cellists become conductors. And I thought I'd do that. And uh, just to make a long story short, when I was, uh, I started having hand problems 
when I was in this conducting workshop, uh, I was still performing in, in New York when I could get work, but I was having a lot of uh, trouble. I had a kind, I had a kind of a, a tendon problem. And so I continued for a couple of years. Then I had an operation. The operation went wrong, and it was the end of my music. strength in, in my hand. I, I, I could move it to about this much. Of it. And uh, I had to make a choice to think about whether I just remain in conducting without actually being able to play, uh, or whether I do something else. And um, on the spirit, I, I knew uh, the son of David Reisman, the nice. son w is a composer, and David's daughter is a Jenny, a wonderful singer whom I performed with. But Reisman said, "We do since this since the age of five. You're in pain. You're always going to resent this. Why don't you at least come to uh, Harvard and?" Um, Give something else a try. <laughs> you know, the difference between where we are now in academia and where we're in the early 60s mm -hmm. is he could simply say, admit this young man. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how I became a sociologist. I mean, uh, I, was, I knew nothing about it. I knew him. Mm -hmm. uh, but... Um, And of course, then the '60s began. So, but to answer your question more intellectually, um, I think a lot of my sociology is built around the model of both the acquisition of skill in in music, that is, as a kind of labor, and even more than that, I would say that the way in which musicians work with each other as a kind of model of sociability. Uh, and I don't mean just cooperation, I also mean patterns of authority. You know, uh, uh, detachment, surrender, which is also the, the, the dialogue between detachment and surrender to the other is part and parcel of, of what goes on in the work musicians do. Uh, I wrote a book on authority that's pretty much modeled on good and bad ways of conducting. Um, so, so for me, uh, this, um, this, my childhood has not disappeared in my sociology, you know. And in the last 10 years, I've had a lot more surgery. I've been able to play again. Uh, not very well, but it's wonderful to be able to play at all. Um, and uh, I realized how much uh, this childhood formation has really guided the kind of uh, sociological models that I had. I, you know, I once had a long talk with uh, a student of Adorno about whether it was the same for him, because I was curious about very few sociologists who have this kind of background that he did. And evidently, Adorno hated to perform. He was somebody who was in his head. And I said, well, that explains the kind of, in a way, the kind of sociology he wrote, the kind of sociology I wrote. I, mean, I couldn't compose a, could compose a line in music to save mm -hmm. my life. Um, but the performative aspect of social life is almost absent in the door. Uh, there are rules, there are practices, but the practice is never explored as something alive. And for me, practice is always in the shaping of practice. As 
those could serve as center for the personality. Good. Um, what about listening to music? Um, do you listen a lot to music? Does it influence the way you think or you write in any way? Um, that's a good question. Um, to be honest with you, when I listen to my, old, my own repertoire, uh, I am a dreadful listener. I'm just thinking I would have done it that way, or not so bad. So <laughs> I am horrible at things that I've performed. If I don't know pieces, or if they're pieces I've learned in the last decade when I've come back to play, I tend to be a little better listener. Uh, but of course the work that, that I've done is, and this must be true for you as an anthropologist as well, I mean our trade is in learning to listen. Yes, sorry? Our trade is learning to yes. listen. Mm. So it's probably the most important skill we have on how to listen actively. And I don't know, maybe that was shaped by music too. But as I say, what I'm mostly conscious of is uh, how ungenerous I am as a listener. <laughs> I was just wondering um, whether, for instance, I think the greatest stylist in, in history, uh, one of my disciplines is, is a man called F.W. Maitland. And he used to, often, often when he was writing, he would be listening to music. And some people have interpreted the the shape of his writing oh, really? as reflecting um, the shape of orchestral works. And uh, I've certainly really? found that when I need really to write something really difficult and inspired, I listen to handball usually. And it sort of elevates me and I feel in touch with something. Yes. Do you ever have this? Never. Ever. I mean, if I if a piece of I write in almost hermetic silence because mm -hmm. a piece of music on I listen to it rather than mm -hmm. concentrate on what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. But I can well understand that that it could be that kind of stimulus. Mm -hmm. What did Maitland write? I'm, just, I'm oh, well, just, uh, embarrassed to say I've never <laughs> heard the name. I'll tell you, he was the greatest English historian. Oh, and and oh, you shame he, he solved the problem of the modern world. I'll tell you how afterwards. But <laughs> okay. Um, this is uh, truly shaming. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. Um, let's go right back again to um, your first school. Do you remember your first school at I all? I do. I went to a Catholic school in Chicago, run by nuns of the Order of the Blessed Virgin, and it was. Um, um, Strict, I don't think, begins to do it just as it had corporal punishment, so on. It was, I, I talked to, to, you know, people I'd grown as adults, people I'd grown up with, who went there as well. And it was um, for black students, the, they and their parents had to relearn, you know, they never had any contact with this was the, the school that was in this housing estate because the Catholic Church had long worked among the poor in this part of Chicago. So imagine for these blacks that they, they're being hit by a white person, a cane. But it's not like the South. You know? It's a whole different order. Corporal punishment. Parents, evidently, my, my mother told me, that, uh, parents, they thought, you know, that these were southern racists come to get them at first. And my mother said, you have to understand, you know, these, this is the Catholic Church. This is how they'll get, you know, belief in original sin, mm. <laughs> discipline, and so on. But that aside, this was, it was all of us did really well. These 
nuns were not interested in understanding racism. And, uh, you know, they were not liberal teachers in any way. They wanted us to achieve. Mm -hmm. And if we didn't achieve, it was because we were sinful and slothful. Mm -hmm. That's a fantastic way to motivate kids. <laughs> <laughs> because it's, there's no explanation. So actually, my generation of people who passed through this school, which had no resources, you know, that outdoor toilets, all the things that are supposed to predispose children to fail. The children did very well. And I gather that's true in Britain as well. The Catholic schools tend in very poor parts of, of England. they turn you into a Catholic? Uh, I can't quite say that. <laughs> what did they turn you into? Uh, I, I have a lot of respect for the Catholic Church. Hmm. You know. And as an adult, I have a lot of uh, sympathy for liberal Catholics who are caught between what is now a very degraded institution run by you know ignorant and backward people. And the actual faith that you know Catholics in a parish will will have and have in their religion. And so um, uh, it's uh, you know they're very sensible to that contradiction. They are believers. Uh, but the church, the church hierarchy has rotted on them. Not for the first time in history, I don't No, know. hardly. <laughs> hardly. But uh, don't you think this is a rather extreme situation? You know, I mean, the Pope who recommends, you know, better to get AIDS than put on a condom. Mm -hmm. uh, who, uh, out of ignorance, takes a, a, a Holocaust and I mm -hmm. back into the church hierarchy. Quite extreme. It's an, I'm, I'm sure it's not the first time, but it's quite a, it's quite a testing moment mm. for your ordinary, intelligent, believing Catholic. So, uh, no, I've never become a Catholic, but I, um, I, I have a lot of sympathy for uh, and feel for it. It's also very important the ritual elements. Uh, to me, as a non-believer, the ritual element has a great aesthetic appeal, which uh, makes most Catholics very unhappy with it. It's a higher form of theory. When do you become a non-believer? I mean, did you lose your faith, so to speak? No, I never had any faith. I, mean, <laughs> I would say that what I became a non-believer in was left-wing politics of, of the sectarian sort mm -hmm. that my family and my mother and uh, our entire movement caught up in in the 50s and 60s. Uh, I, I was a real believer in the new left, mm -hmm. in its non-sectarian, um, easy, rather relaxed way of dealing with politics. Mm -hmm. But I never had any kind of religious conviction. Mm -hmm. And although, you know, uh, we had and we had a wonderful collection of, of icons and also of Jewish you know, menorahs, mm -hmm. a lot of religious sort of stuff mm -hmm. about the house. Uh, but uh, wasn't, it was kind of paraphernalia from, from the past, rather than. You didn't go to church services or anything? No. Never. Mm -hmm. I've never been in either a church or a, or a synagogue, mm -hmm. except to look at. shoots off in another direction. You know, on Monday I had a discussion with the Archbishop of Canterbury uh, in London, mm. sponsored by the Guardian on, on capitalism. Mm. And um, 
It was a very strange uh, occasion because to me this is an ethical problem. The, what capitalism has done to people's social lives. And to him, of course, it's a problem of virtue rather than ethics. And I'm afraid we rather bored our audience because we, we got into <laughs> the difference between ethics and virtue. Um, and I saw it. I mean, I saw why this is quite a remarkable man, Rowan Williams. Mm -hmm. Sin. Mm. Bankers have sinned. It's not a figure of speech. Mm. You know? uh, um, and to me, it's, it's, this is kind of uh, it's not a language that, that I could ever believe in. I mean, I, I, they, to me, they're sinned as a metaphor. Well, we'll probably come back to that a bit later as well. But um, there's been a lot of, certainly in England, a lot of um, talk recently of disproving religion, particularly Richard Dawkins and others, uh, yeah. that um, somehow science and religion are totally opposed. We now know that religion is wrong. And I often ask people what they feel about that. Well, I think Richard, whom I know, is sort of at the wrong end of the stick on this in one way. Um, what he should be really asking is the, about is the uh, strong correlation between religious belief and, and the practice of violence. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think Hitchens goes into that more, yeah, doesn't he? Chris is, mm -hmm. uh, Christopher Hitchens is much more into this. And it seems to me reason for atheism, not agnosticism, but atheism, would be not that beliefs are wrong. We all have wrong beliefs. We all subscribe to some form of magical thinking. I mean, the, the, otherwise, we'd have a very impoverished life. But the kind of magical thinking that goes on in religion is so correlated to the notion of, of destroying or harming or causing suffering people who don't share that belief, that it's, in my view, something humanity has to outgrow. Uh, much better to find other magical practices which, uh, which uh, don't lead to violence. So I, um, I can understand as a scientist how, in particular in terms of the issue of evol evolution, how galling it must be uh, to, to Richard Dawkins uh, that uh, you know creationism or the 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 out of uh, of uh, intelligent design, which is a piece of intellectual nonsense. But you know he it's too nobody was going to live a life without without some kind of irrational belief. What's wrong is the nature of this belief when it predisposes people to, to say that they, they can violate others for this. I once asked Richard if he could be content to be a Zen Buddhist, which of course mm. is a religion about the cessation of, if it is a religion about the cessation of action and will. I think I might have tempted him just a bit. <laughs> <laughs> Hard to know. Uh, I don't know him all that well, but you know, whenever we meet, mm. this, we have exactly the same conversation. Mm. Uh, and so, I mean, what I'm saying is, um, can be just sort of unreflexively taken as a comment on Islam. I don't think about that at all. Look at what's happened to Israel, mm. which has become a state practicing injustice in the, mm. in the name of religion. Mm. Christianity full of this, mm. you know, of, of violent, you know, 
destruction of heretics and so on. Mm. So, you know, it's a systematic, it's not something wrong with Islam. It's mm. a property of religion. And um, I always, in my mind, thought that we should flip Pascal's wager just around. That the safest position is to deny the existence of God. And if you're wrong, you've, you've made a catastrophically bad bet. But you'll probably have done your fellow human beings a great service uh, by just denying that, uh, uh, by so being, so a resolute, being a resolute uh, uh, atheist rather than an agnostic. That leaves too much. I mean, I think most religions on the subject of violence are guilty and prove, until proven innocent. Hmm. Now, I know you studied Japan, I'm sure, that Buddhism is a very different story. The forms of Buddhism, some of them are quite violent and some not, and forms of Taoism and yeah. Confucianism and so on. Are, they're all really not really religions anyway. That, that's the problem. They're not? Not really, no. How do you mean? Well, not by, we better not get into too much. Well, no, 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 I'm very interested. Um, but, but um, I mean, by Western definition of a religion, it has to have a god, and of course, Buddhism it doesn't have a god. Yeah. Uh, nor does Taoism, nor does Confucianism, and none of them have a god. Um, so, they're not by Western standards religions, but let's proceed with that afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's get back to... Um, the next school you went to, you went to this Catholic school from what age to what age? Uh, I went from 6 to 10, 11. Mm. Then I was briefly in Minneapolis where my mother moved. We moved out of Green Green, which got quite violent. And my mother moved there to work as a social worker. And I stayed there for four years and then left. Uh, you know, I started touring. I went back to Chicago and was to Chicago. So um, that's. Um, Do you, I mean, at school, uh, just up to the age of 15, were you in, interested in other things? Do you have hobbies apart from music or games or politics or I acting? I certainly had politics. Uh, I certainly had politics, although, you know. This was, the McCarthy was still warm. Mm. So almost, oh, I was what's called a red diaper baby. <laughs> the children. Uh, so, you know, we were always very, we were cautioned mm. always to be just careful when we talked about. We talked about. Um, I don't know, I think I was only interested in music as I remember it. I was a very sociable little kid. Mm. Uh, and I remained a sociable person all my life. Uh, and I don't know what that's about, mm. but um, uh, I never had the usual sufferings that people had in school, you know, of being the aesthetic wallflower. Mm. You know, was, <laughs> and I was a big kid. Mm. Uh, and you know, I'd grown up in a housing estate, mm. I knew how to take care of myself. But I never really had any uh, of that kind of formation. Mm. Uh, and I've talked to many other musicians about this. You, uh, and in various ways, what was true for me was true for them. There is something very sociable about uh, music. And um, you know, talk to people all the time. You have to learn to play nicely with other people as a child. And so so I, I had it on the whole. I mean, I had some uh, suffering. You know, I, I didn't see my father. I had lots of surrogate fathers, you know, which was North Korea the same thing. But I had, a, I had on the whole a really wonderful childhood um, when I look back on it. And the fact of being able to, uh, I often thought about this, be an adult at the age of 15 was great. Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> when I lived in New York, I, uh, I rented a room when I first went to Chicago when I was 15. But when I was in New York when I was 17, 
I rented uh, a flat with some other friends over an amazing place called Dirty Dick's Foxel Bar, which by day which was a bar for Greek um, stevedores working on the docks west side of New York. And at night was a transvestite bar <laughs> run by the mafia. <laughs> and this was my first real home. This, mm -hmm. well, we were at the floor directly above this, this bar, so the jukebox went all night. It was, we were three musicians, it was heaven for us. <laughs> we could practice until four in the morning, you know. Uh, the bar was, uh, it, it was a kind of casual fall uh, to the, I don't know, squared, mm -hmm. you know. It was an, was all in those days run by the mafia, so um, we, there was complete freedom in it. And uh, it was a wonderful way to practice. We, we had friends over in the middle of the night, and you know, the neighbors wouldn't complain. And so, <laughs> so I had a wonderful time in New York. I was just absolutely fantastic adolescence. And when I listen to what goes on, particularly to my students who grow up, British secondary schools, which are so rigid, you know, they're competing all the time and they're you know, supervised. Mm -hmm. um, it's a kind of totally Foucauldian scopic regime, isn't mm -hmm. it? Mm -hmm. It's a terrible way to have families. No, we'll discuss that too later. <laughs> yeah. You didn't know this. No. You didn't have that kind of youth. Yeah, I, I, not entirely. Uh, I'll, I'll tell it's you about much it. Much better. Um, it's changed a lot. Um, there were no teachers who, especially, influenced you or you remember, inspired. Uh, you? It, it, when I was a music student, mm. of course, mm. of course, there were my cello teacher. Mm. Both of my cello teachers, of course. Mm. When I became a sociologist, that's another story. Should we talk about that? Um, yeah, in a moment, but this, um, because we're just coming towards the end of the tape, so... Um, You've asked me 50 minutes of my childhood. This is wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> this is what we'll keep in Cambridge. <laughs> <laughs> so why don't we end, this is the end of your childhood. Oh, and, very good. And then have lunch and then go on with the rest of your life. Okay, I can do that. Okay. Again.